Well, good morning. Welcome to Valley View. We're so happy that you're here today. Um, if it's your first time visiting with us, we just want to encourage you to fill out a visitor card at either entrance. Um, there's also a small gift at the tables there for you, a journal, um, just to say thanks for joining us today. If you're joining us online, please leave a comment in the, the section below and just let us know that you're with us, worshiping with us today. Um, today is going to be a little bit different kind of service. It is our ministry fair day. I'm sure you noticed as you walked in, it looks a little different. There's tables around the back. Um, Pastor Gavin will give us more information about that a little bit later. So that'll be exciting. Kids, pre-K through fifth grade, if you want to grab a worship bag, the kids are going to be joining us in here today. We don't want them to miss the ministry fair either. Um, I know it's not the first Sunday of the month, but we're going to be all together. Um, I'm going to go ahead and give us a couple of announcements this morning, things that are happening in the life of our church. Next Sunday is our family picnic immediately following the service. Uh, we are going to meet out back. We're going to have fried chicken, potato salad, chips, watermelon. We have a snow cone truck coming. All of this is free. We are just wanting to have a time of fellowship, enjoy each other's company. Um, we are going to have slip and slides. I was going to say that's just for the kids, but it's not. If you're an adult and you want to come and enjoy the slip and slide, uh, feel free. Just make sure you bring a towel to dry off with afterwards. Um, in the month of July, we have a few youth events taking place on Wednesdays, starting on the 10th of July. Um, if you look on any of the bulletin boards by any of our entrances, it'll give you more information about that. They all start at 6 p.m. and are for specific groups of people. Um, so don't miss out. The month of July, uh, you see four events there and um, stuff that's going to be happening with the youth. All right. I just want to invite you to prepare yourselves for a time of worship. I have a passage I want to read from 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 14 and 15. For Christ's love compels us, because we are convinced that one died for all, and therefore all died. And he died for all, that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. Praise be to God. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that we get to gather in this place to worship you, to come before you, to set our minds towards you. Prepare our hearts for all that you have in store for us today. We love you so much. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. I invite you to stand as we go into a time of worship.
may be seated this morning. Don't get used to it. We're just doing something different today. Give you the heads up on that. Scripture reading this morning is out of Isaiah 40, one of my favorite. It speaks to us. It says, have you not known, have you not heard? The Lord is an everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. I love this. He does not grow. He does not faint or grow weary, and his understanding is unsearchable. Did you hear those words? His understanding is unsearchable. In other words, nothing that we encounter or that happened to us in our lives, God 
does not understand and that he is not there to walk through it with us. He said, even youths will faint and be weary and young will fall exhausted. But those who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength and they shall mount up with wings like eagles. Wow, what a neat thing to think about. Wow. And they shall run and not be weary and they shall walk and not be faint. What a wonderful piece of scripture to remind us just kind of what kind of God we have. We have a God that's understanding and that cares for us and loves us and is there in our pain and hurting. <clears throat> Never closes his eyes. I'm fixing to find my way to the altar this morning. So we're doing things a little bit different and pray. I want to invite any of you that would like to come and pray with me to please come. Father, we thank you that you're a God that is continually with us, the same yesterday, tomorrow, today, and tomorrow. Father, we want to lift up, lift, lift up Stacy McNabb to you this morning. Lord, we know that her, her mom and dad are both having difficulties uh, health-wise, and she feels very, very helpless um, in being able to help them. So, Lord, we, we pray that you will touch that situation. Father, I also lift up, lift up John Kelly to you this morning. Uh, Brother John has some, some issues in memory. So, Lord, we pray that you will just touch him this morning. Uh, let him feel your presence, Father. We also lift up Alan Booth to you today, Lord. Um, Father, I just pray for relief for the pain that he has in his back. Also pray for doctor's eyes to be open on how to, to, to help him. Lord, we also lift up our brother Steve Kurtz this morning. Lord, he's been, he's been dealing with this cancer for a while. So, Father, we pray for new medicine for things to happen. Lord, I just pray that you will heal him. But uh, not only lift him up to you, but the family as well, Lord. Father, we also lift up our brother Dale Pierce to you this morning. We know that he's, he's suffering with leg pain and memory as well. So, Lord, we lift him up to you. Um, Father, we also lift up our brother Jerry Emil and Bobby Emil to you this morning. Um, Father, we see you working in his life. He was telling me earlier that he has some doctors that said they didn't need to come, he didn't need to come back and see them. They have dismissed him. And, and not because the medicine hasn't worked, but, but, but because it has. So, Lord, we, we praise you for that. We also lift up Richard Amberg to you this morning for healing. Father, we lift up Loretta Martin to you this morning for memory. Lord, from what I can see, she's doing well. We see you working in her life, Lord. So, Father, I pray that she will just continue to to see that and to remember that you are the healer of all healers. Father, we also lift up Tommy Shop to you this morning uh, for breathing issues. Uh, Lord, we lift up Tyler Lane this morning. Uh, Lord, I pray that he's got some issues with some blood clots or what it may be in his brain. Lord, I pray that the, the right doctor will get a hold of him, Lord, and, and see what needs to be seen and do what needs to be done there. Father, we also lift up Linda Gaskell to you this morning. Lord, we know she has some balance issues and some strength. Lord, I, I pray that, that you will encourage her to, to do what needs to be done, Lord, to help that. Father, we also lift up Belly, Betty Gollyhu to, to you this morning just for health issues in general. Um, Father, I also want to lift up this friend of mine, Kurt Davis, this morning to you. He has suffered a stroke, and a pretty severe stroke. So, Lord, I pray that, for one, that you will just reveal yourself to him, and, Lord, that you will heal him. Father, we also lift up Kelly Strickland to you this morning. Um, we know that she's had a procedure done on her legs for varicose veins so far, but we pray for healing there. 
And I think there's some other procedures that have to be done there. So, Lord, we pray for the pain to be minimal. Lord, I just pray for anyone in this church this morning that is carrying something with them, Lord. Lord, that only you can heal. Father, you're so good to us, and your promise remains that you are the healer of all healers. You are our God, our creator, Lord. So, Father, we thank you for being so good to us. Father, also lift Pastor Gavin up to you this morning, Lord, as he comes. Holy Spirit, I pray you will just move in this place, Lord, move in us this morning. Father, I pray that each of us will be changed when we leave this place this morning. Father, we thank you. It's in your name we ask these things. Amen. Amen. Um, we're, if, you, if you're with us for the first time today, or maybe for the first time in a long time, you'll notice that there's some tables up around. We'll get to that in a moment. We are in our stewardship series and as a part of that, we talked about the first week about stewarding God's creation well and life in general well. And then we talked about, um, then we talked about uh, steward, stewarding our finances well and what that might look like. And if you're thinking, oh man, I'm going to be lost, don't worry. You can go back and get those in the app online um, on Facebook or YouTube. So there's plenty of options for you to be able to do that. And then, and then finally today, we're talking about stewarding our talents our time well. And so what would that mean for us as far as serving the Lord? And so that's why we have this ministry fair taking place. We're going to break in a little while and we're going to send you out and hopefully it'd be more than just fellowship time, but it might also be a time that you would get to say, you know, I was thinking that I should be involved in this way or that way. And there's some different things. We'll talk about that more in a minute. Before we get too far into the message today, I do want to just have us affirm our faith together with the uh, recitation of the Apostles' Creed. <clears throat> we believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he shall come to judge the living and the dead. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Church of Jesus Christ, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and a life everlasting. Amen. Um, speaking about service and, 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 and what it's like to, to be a Christian, uh, who's not necessarily called to be a, a pastor, a Christian who's not necessarily called to be some sort of lay preacher or lay minister. So what does that mean for us as a part of God's kingdom? Well, one, one example that I've heard over and over again is, is like um, kids sports teams. And the interesting thing about kids sports is if you put a kid in sports at five years old, or that's about the age they, they're able to go in, you put them in at five years old, and they have this rule, every kid must play. And, and, and so that's the kind of the neat thing, every kid gets to play, but then every kid must play. And I remember a couple years ago, there was a, a, a one of our one of our kids, uh, I think maybe a second grader, um, didn't have a coach for their soccer team. And I was like, I'll go do this. And they had a rule. Everybody plays. Everybody. And I remember thinking, boy, I sure wish I didn't have to put this kid in. <laughs> They're second graders, so I mean, it was fine. But I remember thinking, yeah, e every kid needs to get in. And so I would be running around. Basically, I I'm not a coach at this point for these second graders. I'm a timekeeper. It's been six minutes. Hey, you out, you in. And making sure everybody gets in. But you know, here's the problem. As, as you move up and you get a little bit older and things get a little bit more competitive, you move from all play into something, some, a new invention. And this new invention is called bench. You've heard of the bench? So when the bench is there, you have the players who play a lot and you have the players who, who they're on the bench. But they get to come in, right? Because the good players are going to get a little tired. Uh, they're going to... They're going to need, you know, substitutions, and they're going to need, you know, to get maybe maybe someone gets injured or something, or or maybe you know, uh, somebody's 
gone that day, and one of the bench players gets to go out on the field, and it's great. And, and, then, and then you get to eventually, if you get to maybe, maybe the highest levels of high school, but certainly into college and professional, where really only the best of the best get to play. And so you can be a player who goes, I had a friend who went to Texas Tech and never stepped foot on the field one time. He was on the football team for five years. He never got on the field once because he wasn't the best of the best, but he was on the team. And so he sat there every game like this, never went on. I think, I believe he was the third string kicker. Kickers don't really get uh, injured too often. So he just sat there. And that's what he did on the team. And, and at the end, he said, well, I had a good time, but didn't really feel like I was a player. And unfortunately, this is how sometimes a church is. We're a group of people who were happy sending just a few people out to be involved in this ministry or that ministry. We have our pastor or a youth pastor, a children's pastor. Maybe we have some sort of other associate pastor. And if it's a big church, you could even have... You can even have 30 pastors or 30 paid staff on your list, and it's a church of 5,000 people. And wow, look at all these people. 30 whole people are out there doing ministry. But the success of the church, and not just a local church, but the success of the ministry of the church that's handed over to us by Jesus Christ depends not on a system where we choose our 1% to go out and minister, but rather it it. it, it needs a system where we say everybody plays. There's no bench players. There are no bench players in the kingdom of heaven. And so what does it mean for us to all participate? So as opposed to sports teams, we might also think about this as a village. And one thing that I always appreciated about villages in Congo, I'd be walking through and you'd see everybody was busy all the time except for I'll qualify that and say um, there's different times of your life uh, where that changes. But a village thrives on communal work. So even, even the children have their jobs that they do. And we would see children walking around selling eggs, carrying this big stack of boiled eggs on top of their head. And you're thinking, man, I sure hope they don't drop those. And they're walking around the village because what they know is someone else is going to be walking by or you go by someone's front door and they say, man... I need a few eggs. And you're going to buy some eggs, and you're going to eat those, and they're ready for you. It's fast food, Congolese style. So even the kids have their purpose, and, and the women, uh, maybe, maybe the teenagers are doing uh, gathering water, sweeping. The men are out working in the fields. And then you even have the elders, the community elders, who these are the ones where I smiled. These guys sit on their front porch all day. They've done their work. Their backs are hard. And, and nobody says these men are lazy. No one says these guys aren't doing their job. What they say is their job has changed. They were children who mostly got to play, but maybe sold eggs and did some other small things. They did rustled up the chickens when they got too far away or whatever. Um, and, and, then, and then they grew up and they became strong men and, or, or women. And, and they did the hard work in the fields and that labor and carrying produce to town. But eventually they get to the point where they can't do that work. And so they become the wisdom of the community. They become the story keepers of the community. They become the encouragers of the community. And, and so their work changes as you go through. And so instead of a system where we think uh, maybe we have a CEO and our CEO has a board and those are the people who are in charge of the, king, of the ministry of the kingdom of heaven, um, I think it's probably much more like a chief system where even though you think there's a chief, there's a, there's a series of elders who come together and they all work for the betterment of the community. And so uh, there's no notes today. I just knew that it was going to be a little bit different for us, and we're about to break and send you out to your different places, and we'll talk more about that in just a moment. But I want you to know, um, still, this, I, want, I still have this big idea for you to keep in mind. The church is not a sports team. It is a village. We are all meant to participate in the creative and restorative work of the kingdom of heaven. So you don't ever retire from your relationship with the Lord. And if you can't retire from a relationship with the Lord, you don't ever get to the point where you say, well, I don't, need, I don't need to pray anymore, right? I've prayed a bunch. The Lord's tired of hearing me pray, so I'm not going to pray anymore. You'd, you'd never say that. You'd never say that. And if praying is a significant part of our faith, then serving the Lord is also a significant part of our faith. It's equally important. So if you can't retire from your 
prayer side or your spiritual discipline side or reading the Bible side, then you also can't retire from your service side. That's something you also can't retire from. However, your service is probably going to change throughout the years. You might be a kid playing tag here after church. And one day, you might be a pastor. You might be a Sunday school teacher. You might be making meals on Wednesday nights. Who knows? We've, um, we've spoken about, I've tried to bring, keep this on the forefront of our minds. We've mentioned... Um, that as we're following Christ together, as a faith community, we recognize that, that uh, there's a spiritual side to how we should be growing. And, and so we, in our three-tiered or three, uh, yeah, we'll say three-tier uh, process of, of being a faithful disciple of Jesus Christ, um, one is that we would have spiritual growth. We come to church we, we, we hopefully maybe do a Bible study or join a small group or something like that, and, and that's our spiritual side. And so much of us just end with it like that. But I would also say that it's significant for us to be in fellowship together, to have those times of community, to have those times when we're just learning to do life together, and that teaches us about loving someone who is not a blood relative of mine, and yet I love this person. I sacrifice for this person. When they weep, I weep. When they're happy, I'm happy. And we share those things together. And finally, I would say that we're not fully living into our Christian call if we're not also involved in service in some way. And so um, we, I, we had this crazy idea. What if, we, what if we put all the ministries, and these aren't all the ministries. I say these are the majority. What if we put those right out in front of people and, and said, hey, these are everything that we need. This is everything that's going on and give you a chance to participate in that. And so that's what this ministry fair has come out of, or what, what birthed this ministry fair. And some people said, I have never heard of a church doing that. Me neither. I've never heard of a church doing that either. And we, we tried to make this morning um, uh, feel like regular church, but now we're going to pause from that. So if you're following along online, whether today, live right now, or if you're doing that, you know, in a few days or weeks from now, I would encourage you to go to vvnaz.org. Um, and see if you can find any more information about what's going on and pray about how the Lord might move you. So with that said, I have a slide for you um, that has kind of our ministry fair, um, ministry fair uh, tables. So facing this way, you, you know, there's tables all the way around like this. So the first one is a youth table. Then you have what we're calling compassion just because it's shorter than saying food pantry, clothing boutique, and garden ministry. So that's in that second table there. Discipleship, discipleship back in this corner. Um, if you're thinking about joining a small group, if you've never, uh, or, or joining a Sunday school class, or even if you're thinking of, you know, there's not a Sunday school class for me, and, and maybe I would like to be a part of starting one or a small group or something like that, um, that would be the place to go to. Or if you're thinking, you know, there's a class that I feel like I could teach, even if it was for one six-week period. If that's you, go to the discipleship table. We have the worship table again, which would include um, if you feel led to be a uh, person who would sing or play an instrument, um, or if you would be someone who'd be willing to sit in the back and go through slides and help with the sound and things like that, that's your table over there. Um, this one is the maintenance team table. Everyone wants to be on the maintenance team. It's the coolest one, right? So you go back there, and, and, and uh, that would be, you know, we do things all the time, and we just want to let you be a part of that and uh, serving in that way, and, and we, we've had probably uh, once every other year, a work day. This would, uh, take, this would not do away with work days, but help us just to do some stuff in between that time. Connections table. This is an interesting one. If, we're, if you want to be on a prayer team that prays for people, if, you wanna be on a, if you'd be willing to be in a group that sends out maybe cards or letters of encouragement to people, if you want to be a part of welcoming people um, as a greeter or in some other way, um, that would be the table to go to there. Meal team, um, Wednesday nights or funerals or, or weddings or um, special meals that we have together as a church, that would be a meal team. You wouldn't be asked to do everything all by yourself, but you could be a part of a team that does that. And then finally, children's ministry. Uh, uh, if you're interested in learning how to be a sponsor there. So at this time, what we're going to do is we're going to break. We're not going to go home. We've got more singing to do. We've got more message to do. But we're going to take a break from those things right now, and we're going to continue considering what does it mean to serve the Lord with my 
um, with my talents, with my skills, with my time. And so we can go ahead and hit those lights on uh, and just encourage you, if you're leading a table, head to those places, and then we'll let uh, people kind of move around. And I want to encourage you, if you're thinking, I'm already really involved, great, go to a place where you can encourage others. If you're thinking that you don't know where to go and it's not possible, just, just try walking around and see if the Lord doesn't speak to you about one table. So I want to encourage you to do that at this time.
looking in This is where it goes again We were hungry, we were thirsty But nothing left to give For the shape that we were in And just when all hope seemed lost Love opened the door for us He said, come to the table Come join the sinners who have been redeemed Take your place beside the Savior Sit down and be set free Come to the table To the young and to the older, all who hunger, all who thirst, all the last and all the first, all the paupers and the princes, all who fail, you've been forgiven, all who dream and all who suffer, all who loved and lost another, all the chained and all the free, all who follow. to the table the one thing you didn't see coming and no one would blame you no you cried in private but you tried to hide it away so no one knows no one will see you stop believing we're gonna we're gonna start wrapping it up here
right, why don't you begin to make your way back? We'll be starting up here again in just a minute. If you need to sign up at one more table, feel free to do that and then make your way back. All right, we're starting up again in about 30 seconds, so sign that form that you're looking at and head right back to your seat. Let me just invite you to make your way back um, to your seats now, and, and I just want to remind us kind of the thought or the big idea for the, for the message today is that we, uh, we don't want to be on a sports team per se. The church, rather, is a village. And so with that in mind, I want to read to us from Luke chapter 10, uh, verses 1 through 9. Luke chapter 10, verses 1 through 9. After this, the Lord appointed 72 others and sent them on ahead of him in pairs to every town and place where he himself intended to go. He said to them, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, ask, to, ask the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Go on your way. I'm sending you out like lambs into the midst of wolves. Carry no purse, no bag, no sandals, and greet no one on the road. Whatever house you enter, first say, peace to this house. And if a person of peace is there, your peace will rest on that person. But if not, it will return to you. Remain in that same house, eating and drinking whatever they provide, for the laborer deserves to be paid. Do not move about from house to house. Whenever you enter a town and its people welcome you, eat what is set before you. Cure the sick who are there and say to them, the kingdom of God has come near. And this is the word of the Lord for God's people this morning. You know, um, I love this passage, the, specifically Luke 10, verse 2, used to be my big missionary passage. Uh, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Therefore, pray to the Lord of the harvest that he may send out workers into his harvest fields. That's the NIV translation. Uh, that's the one I have memorized. But I would, I would travel all over the country, and I would speak in church after church, and I would, I would tell them the same thing, that God is sending out people into the harvest fields. And they would always tell me, well... I'm, I can't go to Africa like you do. And I said, that's fine. You don't have to go to Africa. You go next door. You go down the street. You go across town. And, and the hard thing for people was seeing themselves as one of God's laborers. I really discovered that was an issue. And so one thing that we notice in Jesus' ministry, he kind of does this thing when he starts. You notice when Jesus starts, he, he just starts walking around and he's like, hey, you're going to follow me. And he goes over here, oh, you guys like fishing? Yeah, well, I'm going to teach you how to really fish. So they come follow him. And he just kind of gathers this group. And everywhere they go, they're gathering people. But we, sometimes we imagine it stopped with 12. But what we know is that Jesus kind of traveled with a whole entourage of people. And so that's why when he first sends out the group, there was an inner 12, that's for sure. He sends out that group, and they go out, and they come back, and they report what happened. Then... Uh, Jesus sends out the 72, and that's what happens here. And he, so there was at least enough 
close other people that he limited that to 72 and sent them out again in pairs, gave them some instructions. But here's the amazing thing. When they come back, when they're gathered back together, that's when the crowd of people are following them to now see this Jesus, to now be a part of what Jesus is doing. And that's when they're fed and they receive uh, the, the 5,000 men are fed and they, they receive all that food that we mentioned last time from just one small meal. And so the point of you going out or the point of you being in ministry, the point of giving of your time and your giftings of your strengths, the point of you doing that isn't just because I've got a Christian checklist and, and service is one of them. Check. Pastor said three tiers to, 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 to being a... a, a, a faithful disciple of Jesus Christ, and one of them is service. So I will check that box, right? Discipleship, check. Fellowship, check. Service, check. Great. No, the reason isn't, isn't for any of those things. The reason that we serve, the reason we steward our time in ways that we're able to be a part of other things is because the whole point of that is that we lead people back to Jesus. We bring them home to see the Father. We bring them into the place where they can hear, where they can see, where they can be a part of what God's doing. And the harvest is plentiful. It's a promise right from the very beginning. God wants to do amazing things in the lives of his church, of his church people. But I'd rather say of the church because the church is, is really meant to be people. We speak about the church like a building all the time. It's something that we just can't help but do. But really, the Bible talks about the church, and that's the group of people that follow Christ. So the harvest is plentiful. We just need the workers. And I don't care. I don't care. This, that's not what I'm saying. But I could be the best pastor in the history of the world. I could be the best preacher. When I preached, you wept and you laughed and you thought deeply every single week. And it could be such that people would leave other churches and come to this church because I was so good at preaching. And I was the best pastor in every other way. And every time you saw me, you just said, oh, thank the Lord for a pastor. Even if it was true, best pastor in the world, it still would not be enough to excuse you of your responsibility to be a good steward of what God has given you. To use the giftings and the strengths and the talents the Lord has bestowed upon you. To use the time that the Lord has given you. You ever have a friend pass away or a family member and they say, man, they passed away too young. They still have lots of time. But what are we going to do with the time? Time's a blessing. I was telling somebody just this week about a, a friend I lost at 18 years old. I had him in my kindergarten class, and I had him in plenty of my, my 12th grade classes, one of my best friends ever, and he passed away. And every once in a while, I would sit around and I would think, man, I've just had so much more time. He didn't get that much. So what am I going to do with it now? So here's the interesting thing. Throughout history, God used to speak through, through people he would appoint, leaders, judges, kings, prophets. And now the crazy thing is, you don't have to be a special, amazing person. God wants to speak to you. God wants to use you. Whoever you are, whatever your age is, whatever your experience is, whatever your income level is, whatever your nationality is, God wants to speak to you and use you because that is the vision of the church. One of my very favorite stories in scripture is the disciples are gathered together in John chapter 20. They're scared. Jesus has been crucified. He's, they're coming after us. So the doors are locked. And Jesus appears in their midst. He breathes in their face, tells them to receive the Holy Spirit. And what happens because they receive the Spirit? They open the locked doors, they put their fear behind them, and they go out and begin to tell people the good news of Jesus Christ. There is a lot to say about what happens when we go. That's why Jesus says, okay, when you go into this house, you speak peace and you stay. And, and, and we could get into all of that, but I'm really focusing on the fact that Jesus sends a large group out. And continues to send over and over again. But the idea is you don't join a service position for status. You don't join a service position because you want to um, uh, gain wealth. Um, that's why it says when you go, you go to the first house. You wish peace upon that house. If that house is, uh, receives you, then your peace will rest there. 
And peace is kind of a, a simple translation of the word shalom, which would have been the word that they were using, wholeness, restoration, the presence of God. And so they wish that upon the house. But then you're meant to stay in that house. And sometimes you're thinking, I've had a visitor, boy, I've had a visitor who came and wouldn't leave. But the idea here was you don't go into a house and then when you get a better offer, you go to the better offer. And then, oh, well, oh, now the mayor wants to have me in their house. Okay, now I'll go to the mayor's house. Ooh, now a congressperson or something like that. You know what I'm saying? So the idea was that you would stay in the first house you come to and that, yes, you could eat uh, in that home, but you're not going to receive anything else. Which is why you don't even carry a bag. You don't carry a purse. But rather, you go out and you go to the first place. And yes, we're sending you out like sheep amongst the wolves. We don't have time to get into what exactly that means, but if you get involved in ministry, and if you have been involved in ministry, you might have already experienced the fact that sometimes I went out and I thought everything was going to be happy and rainbows and sunshine, and instead someone hurt my feelings. Something didn't go the way I expected it to, and that's the nature of being in the world. Hopefully it's not the nature of of ministering here in this local church, in this uh, community of faith. But trust God to care for you. When you say, but if, if I give more time to this, what does that mean for these other things that I do or these other responsibilities? Will there even be time? Trust God to, um, to bless your time that you would be able to get other things done, other commitments done that you need to, if you're willing to add these other areas of service. So the, assi- the essential issue for us I'm picking up on this passage, and it comes back to me over and over again, is the fact that we are sent. Jesus isn't a normal guy. Normally what we do is we get together and we say, we want to amass the biggest group that we can. We want to gather all these people, and we bring them in, and we sit here together, and we just, we, we, we just go on into glory together. But rather, what Jesus does, he says, I don't care about power. Let's send this group out. And a lot of these things, you might say, well, that's internal stuff. But youth ministry and children ministry in particular have been one for us where people from our community who don't attend church anywhere have said, yeah, sure, we'll take free daycare. (laughs) They might think of it as free daycare, but what we recognize is we get to be a part of teaching children and teens about Jesus, and they would have never got that before. And they get to go home, and they get to share that. I remember one time, we have time. We have time for this story. I remember one time, Jesus, uh, Jill and I were teaching a group of kids about Jesus in our neighborhood. And they would come once a week, and they would memorize scripture, and they would get a Bible lesson, and they would do a craft. It was like a one-day VBS, and we did this every week for about six months. And people from the community kept saying, you know, we didn't want our children to go to a foreigner's house. But when they came back to us reciting scripture, when they came back to us behaving, we said, We'll just keep sending them there. We'll just keep sending them to your house. Wouldn't it be amazing if people said, we're not necessarily interested in coming to church, but well, we'll send you our kids. We'll send you our teenagers. We'll send you our young people. And they came home and witnessed to their families. Wouldn't that be amazing? The food pantry is one of those ways where we get to just be a part of blessing people. And the clothing boutique as well. And, and, and the gardening ministry goes on with that. We bring people into our church who would never come to a church. And sometimes, most of them come just right out the front here. But they, some of those people, that's their only interaction with a church. And somebody prays for them. Somebody cares about them. Somebody remembers their name. And that speaks a lot. Even if they never come in here, they still continue to go. Yes, there's other ministries like our worship ministry and certainly the discipleship ministry and, and, the, and the, the food and all the things that we're doing, the maintenance. All those things are involved somewhat in this place and out of this place, but it helps us be the best witnesses we can when we go and when we're sent. So the essential issue, again, is that we are called to go. We're called not to be a sports team where we sit back and say, this is our best one. Send them out. They're going to win for us. They're going to score the the, the final point. They're going to win. Final point. It's like, I've never heard of sports before, but, uh, you know, final basket. They're going to throw that final basket and get a home run for us. Um, I'm just struck by the fact that Jesus is talking to his his followers, and what he's concerned about is the fact that there's too much blessing to go around. There's too much that needs to be done. I'm willing, I'm ready to bless you in amazing ways, but you have to go. 
why, why doesn't the Lord just do it all himself? Why doesn't he just zap people's hearts and, now, oh, now I love you and I come to church? That's, a, that's another discussion for why God doesn't force us to love him or force us to do things. But certainly, God chooses to work through us. As insignificant as we may feel, as weak as we may seem, as unskilled as we often claim that we are, God wants to work through us. So what, what will we do with the talents the Lord has given us? As we consider, as we wrap up this stewardship series, and I probably could have done six or eight weeks, uh, but I decided just to give you three. So this is our last day of the stewardship series. But what will you do with your talents, whether it's money, whether it's time, whether it's life, whether it's your gifts, what will you do with them? And I'm reminded of a, another story where Jesus, Jesus actually a parable Jesus tells, and he says, a king goes, uh, goes away and he leaves, uh, he leaves, his, uh, so, leaves his servants with some talents. And, and some have said, well, that's really specifically a, a part of a, a, a measure of money. And it, the debate's still out on that. But he leaves them with the talents. And some he leaves, uh, one he leaves with five, another he leaves with two, another he leaves with one. He says, don't worry, I'm going to come back one day. You know the story, right? And so when, when, the, when the king comes back or the businessman or whoever, however it is, and it's told several times in Scripture, so it would be a little different each time. When he comes back, he, he, he gathers, he, he collects his servants together, and he goes to the one with five. He says, what have you done? The servant says, five. says, guess what? Don't worry, Lord. I took your five, I worked hard, here's five more. Take your ten, and the, and the servants, uh, and, and that's what the servant says, and, and the, the master is like, oh man, good job, you know, come and enjoy, uh, come and enjoy being in my presence. The second one, he's like, yeah, hey, master, you gave me two, I didn't have as much as that guy, and I only had two instead of five, but I still took the two, and I worked hard, and here's two more, so take your four, and the, and the master welcomes him, good job, you did what you're supposed to do. Then you have the servant who has one. He says, Master, I know that you're severe. I know that you reap where you did not harvest. I know that, that, that you're kind of a bad dude. So what I did is I took this one talent and I buried it and I kept it safe. So when you come back, I could dig it back up and say, Master, here it is. Here's what you gave me. And the master is mad. He takes it away and he gives it back to the other servant. And he says, he says, you, you don't get to participate in the blessings of the kingdom. I don't want us to come away with the fact that pastor said, if we don't serve in a significant way, we're going to hell. That's not the message. But the idea that Jesus wants to give, give uh, to his followers, but both 2,000 years ago and today, as well as every day in between, what Jesus wants us to know is that he's given us something. And even if you look and say, oh, I don't have as many talents as the next person. They had five, I only had two. They got two, I only have one. I can't even, I barely have one. Sometimes you look around and say, oh, man, I barely have one talent. But the Lord says, I give you this so that you can be a good steward of it. Being a good steward of it isn't just holding on to it and keeping it. Whether that's money, whether that's skills, whether that's life itself, whether it's how we use creation, all of it is meant to be for God's glory and God's use. And so we should use it. We should find a way to serve. And if we start serving, and, and I'm not sure if we had a lot of people signing up at the youth. Man, if you start serving and you say, man, youth ministry isn't for me, you can move on. But what, I'm, what I think is you might be serving and you might say, man, I need a little more excitement in my life. I need to go to the youth group. The truth is they do have a good uh, group of, of um, volunteers as it is. But you never know what the Lord might be calling you to. So all that to say is we don't want to be people who look back and say, Lord, I saved what you gave me. When the Lord said, think of what I could have done. Think back to what, what happens next in the story. All the disciples, the 72, return. And they say, Jesus, we were casting out demons. We were healing people. We saw Satan fall from heaven which is an interesting thought, is Satan in heaven? So whatever they saw, whatever they understood was the kingdom of heaven taking precedence, precedence and moving forward. And they said, we got to be a part of it. And so many that 72 people were sent out and conservatively 10,000 people followed them back to see Jesus. That's a good harvest. That's a good return on your investment. 
There's nothing that you can do that Jesus won't use if you do it in his name. You do it for his kingdom. You do it for his glory. You do it for his honor. You do it for his sake. God will use that. God will bless it. And God will bring um, a harvest in because of it. I want to invite the worship team up. We're closing now. And I just want you to consider, uh, finally, your place in, your place in the... Uh, what's your place in the village? Are you a child kind of playing, playing tag after church, enjoying yourself occasionally, running out and, and participating in other things? Are you a maturing Christian who says, yeah, I'm just learning kind of how to do some of these things and the Lord wants me maybe to, to take on some more work right now? Are you somebody who's been working in, in one area and saying, you know, maybe my talents or my giftings, my strengths would be best used in another area? Are you somebody who says, well, I, physically speaking, I, I can't do a lot of the things that we're talking about? And would you be perhaps becoming someone who serves on a, on a prayer team, on an encouragement team, who continues to, to love and encourage people and, and carry on the story of faith? Is that what the Lord is asking you in this time? Just before our final song, let's pray that the Lord would help us and speak to us that we might use his gifts well. Father in heaven, we thank you that you trust us to be your stewards of your earth, your creation, all of the created order, the cosmos. Lord, we don't deserve it, we don't earn it, and yet you hand it over to us. So we pray, Lord, that not only would be good, we would be good stewards, we would use our time and our money wisely, that we would care well for creation and things that you have brought into existence. But Lord, we pray for that final vision of the new heaven and the new earth as a city coming together. A city, basically, a, a village where everything works the way it should. Every member is involved in serving you and glorifying you. That's the image we have at the end of our recorded scripture. So we trust that if, there's, if you've been speaking to our hearts, Lord, that you will help us carry it out into fulfillment. If you've been encouraging us or challenging us, Lord, that we wouldn't be afraid, but we would trust you. And Lord, again, we do this not because we necessarily want our church to grow, but we want people to know you better, to love you better, to serve you better. And so, Lord, as we give and as we gather and as we grow as a people, we just pray that that would be something that happens in our community because of how you used us. And whether you give us five talents or two talents or one talent, Lord, we pray that you make us faithful in using them in ways that glorify you. We trust all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Why don't you stand as we sing our final song together?
you to open your hands and receive the benediction as you go this morning. May the grace of Christ renew our lives. May the love of the Father enable us to love others. May the fellowship of the Holy Spirit empower us to discern, obey, and complete the will of God. Let us go out and fulfill the call of the church until Christ comes again, and God will be with you to the end of days. Amen. God bless you. You are dismissed.